Welcome, welcome to the second session on mobility where we are going to focus on bicycles and urban planning. Understood as a tool for the intervention in public spaces. Last Tuesday we talked about aviation and next Tuesday we will be talking about the potential of railways but I am really glad to be able to moderate this session because that's a means of transportation that I really love. So I would like to thank as always the organizations that made these days possible, the Green European Foundation, Transición Verde and the Foundation Nos Horizons and obviously the speakers who I will be introducing momentarily and everyone who is on the other side of the screens to try and compensate for this distance you know doing things online you can always uh, try and make yourselves heard and, and felt through the chat so if during the presentations you have any questions or doubts you can always ask your questions by using the chat function we will be reading your questions and during the last part of this session we will be answering your questions so my name is Raúl Gómez. I did not introduce myself. I am the director of Transición Verde. I will be moderating this session, which, as I said, is the second session out of three sessions dedicated to mobility. We are going to be benefiting from these sessions to introduce the European uh, Atlas on Mobility by the Heinrich Boll uh, Stiftung, and I'm going to share uh, some information with you so that you take a look at the Atlas when you can. So you should be able to see my screen now. So the European Atlas on Mobility is um, actually a report uh, made by Heinrich Boyle Stiftung and the Spanish version has been created together with the Green European Foundation. It is a large analysis from different perspectives of mobility, mobility in Europe. But more specifically with regards to bicycles, which is what we will be focusing on now, I wanted to show you that it actually tackles it from a, a perspective that is not your traditional perspective. It's actually something we thank them for because they consider tool, um, bicycles as a tool and as a loading tool and its potential so that it could enter commercial areas and cities I thought was very interesting. And I also see here some good practices such as bicycle in Copenhagen and the extension of high-speed routes, so high-speed routes for bicycles that they are currently creating in the city of Copenhagen. So here you have a form, we sent you a form to register for these days, these sessions, and we will be sending it once again to you once we're done with the videos for these sessions. So since this is a European atlas, we wanted to kind of land it um, here in Spain and together with No Solitons you can see some data regarding the dangerousness um, suffered by pedestrians and cyclists compared to other means of transportation and we thought that we needed to land this here in Spain so Transición Verde and No Solitons decided to work together to make an annex on Spain and I also wanted to show you a couple images of the bicycle um, focusing on Spain. So you can see here stats of uh, how many cyclist lanes we have per thousand inhabitants in Spain. It's actually 0.08 in big cities and in Amsterdam it's 1.5. So we have a long way to go to be at their level. And to your right you can see some maps of the um, lanes, the cyclist lanes and in those cities. And I would like to shortly stop on these images because if we can see them on a map, we can see for instance that this is Barcelona. Um, here you can see in black lines the um, bicycle lane for movement and the red one is what we consider leisure bicycle lanes. So bicycle lanes are very much included and integrated in the city Cities. There are some areas that are uh, downtown city, areas that should be pedestrian only. So we see in Seville that we have the same situation. We have a bicycle lane well integrated in the city. We have the um, historic um, area, the down, downtown for pedestrians in Valencia that has changed a lot its mobility during these last 10 years. We also see that it has changed. We have lots of leisure lanes, red lines. That's the old bed of the Turia River or the Albufera area. And then Madrid, where we see that the policies that have been 
Uh, the core of mobility planning in Spain have developed a red ring, a leisure ring that is actually very good for some days, but that don't really help for your day-to-day -day mobility, which is that of people who move around the city. So as I was saying, all of this can be found on the links that are available and that we will be sending to you once again um, after these uh, sessions are done, but I don't want to steal more time from the speakers with these documents that you have here at your disposal. They're all available for you. So we will now tackle today's topic, bicycle in public spaces. So in order to introduce the first speaker, I'm going to read a brief fragment of a book that I recommend to you, which is uh, by Marc Auger that was published in 2008, I think. I don't know if you can read it, but this is um, actually um, a node to bicycle. And the fragment is the following. It's chapter called The Urbanization of the World, looking, the lost, uh, looking for the Lost City. And he says, and what about utopia, transforming cities? Is it a um, feasible dream? And bicycle, does it have a protagonist role in this revolution? Because obviously we are talking about a revolution in the literal sense when we talk about transforming the city, what's urban extends itself all over, but we have lost the city and we also lose sight of one another. And facing this landscape, bicycle has a determining role, helping human beings recover the uh, self-awareness and that of the places they inhabit. And with these words, I want to give the floor to our first speaker, Pilar Vega Pintado, who is a geographist, who is an expert in urban planning. She's a professor of the Complutense University in Madrid, and she's also a consultant in GEA21. So Pilar, is it exaggerated to say that we live in cities that due to the um, increase of uh, cars protagonism has has separated us and has left us as mere pedestrians? How can we change that? How ca can we revert the situation? What would be the role of bicycles in this revolution? Please go ahead. Good afternoon and thank you for the invitation. It's actually very complex to be able to give a solution here and no one really has this crystal ball that would allow us to see the future and cities are very complex. The problem with mobility is the following. There's always been transportation in cities. This is not something that can be avoided, the transportation of, of people and, and goods. But in the scale of cities, we have really seen a transformation of their scale in the last 100 years, since the 20s and last century, it's been a complete transformation. So this idea of planning cities in an organized manner in an orderly fashion, because they were anti-hygienic and they were they were too busy, it wasn't good for the productive system because they couldn't really transport uh, goods quickly enough. Mm. They they needed to be able to use this technological advance, uh, advance that were motor vehicles and they couldn't really transport people um, in those cities. So there were uh, traffic jams, as you could see in, in, in New York and Madrid. So this, this uh, model of a city, the pre-industrial um, city model was not good enough. So some well-considered um, architects uh, such as Le Corbusier and the um, modern architects um, considered the that they sh needed to do something like the Charter of, uh, of Athens in thirty three. They signed it, ratified it, and that's when urbanism, urban planning started digging deep into cities and that's when methods started to be applied what and they, what they do is they organize cities in a way that they are segmented in time and space and and what it does is allow for the growth of cities to take place at a higher scale so what we currently have is the inheritance of all of that because our current movement plan is based on, on that charter. So all the left wing and right wing parties, green parties, yellow parties, all of them agreed with that way of organizing the territory. And it was really difficult for us to fight against it because the way in which we have planned the cities is, is that way. So how can we improve what we have? Well, everything has been written for a very long time, since the 60s in the last century. So the only thing that we need is political will. Is there political will? No, there isn't. Why? Well, because it's very difficult. We're always looking for for additives 
something so that we don't have to change the model. The model is based in functional segregation of the territory, urban territory, and just one function for a specific time in a specific space and a specific collective or person or being, uh, work, uh, trade, um, housing, and and big uh, communication and transportation access that connect these pieces in the city. So it's very difficult. It's very difficult because how can we really change this scale by making it closer? Um, well, they have tried to, have, people have tried to do things in Barcelona, or they have tried to do it in San Sebastián. We've tried to do it in many cities and we can try and improve the environmental quality of our cities. But the problem is that the metropolitan peripheral areas still have a very high load of traffic that is unbreakable. So of all the solutions that we have, we have sustainable urban movement planning. I actually directed for some time many plans. I can say that almost 20 mobility plans, the first generation of mobility plans, I was in charge of them since 2004 when we started to do them with the DAI and the subsidies that we had at the time. It, it was until the economic crisis we were doing mobility plans and all town, city councils that had over, over a thousand inhabitants do, do them. I'm sorry, 10,000 inhabitants do this, but they haven't applied it. So everything is written. You have to do this, you have to do that. But now that they have to ask them for the next generation funds, they haven't approved those plans. They don't know where those plans are. And that can't, that, that can't be accepted. There is a lack of mobility culture in administrations. I mean, politicians do not have that culture, but um, all of our civil servants, uh, technical civil servants and city councils don't have that culture either. And that's a problem because we're always in a hurry to apply this or that measure that I know of, actually, we have been asking for um, a change in the mobility model um, for a very long time. I have been since the 80s with Ecologistas en Acción, Edenad, with different associations asking for the town hall, of, um, for downtown and cities to be changed, to change the territorial model, to stop having... Um, highway rings around the cities but no one listened to us but in the 70s we already knew that everything was going um, was going down during the Rio summit we knew that that was going uh, wasn't going well so what can we do we can't do much because we're very late a mobility plan if it is approved by someone if there is money it takes around 20 years to execute all measures and we don't have 20 years anymore. We don't have that that time. The scenario has changed. So, so we are not going to reduce climate change, obviously, but we're not going to stop it or anything. Let's see how we who live in cities make this more comfortable for us so that we can breathe without uh, direct pollution and so on and so that there is less noise and so on. So that's that's the thing. And now we're talking about low emission areas and and there are um, lots of plans for bicycles in different cities. But since it's not mandatory and no one has ever said that this is going to be implemented, well, they don't do anything in Madrid, for instance, since, uh, I don't know, maybe Laura has it fresh in her memory. But it was our company who did it, that plan, the whole network it was, a network with its meshes, with its different um, levels of connecting all the neighborhoods in Madrid, but it has never been executed. And why hasn't it been executed? Well, because it was it was actually cheaper than having a parking lot or the uh, Metrinta tunnel or many different actions, but they didn't want to do it. So with regards to the low emission um, areas thing, which is very much in vogue right now, I think it's wonderful. But the thing is that they are not going to be as powerful as they should. Uh, there's going to be electrical cars, there's going to be all sorts of of vehicles that we are interested in in having in those areas so in the end we will have low emission cities that will be collapsed with electric cars i don't know what solution that can really offer to the future of cities because we will have metropolitan areas that will always have traffic jams and they will be jammed with vehicles that require lots of energy for their uh, for their fabrication i don't know if you have read the ecological accounts of transportation in spain that we drafted in 2014 you will be able to see that much of the energy that is being consumed in transportation takes place when the vehicle is being manufactured and when um, throwing the vehicles for scraps so renewing 
the whole um the the whole all of the cars in the city so that they're electrical is not a solution. I mean, we can either focus on public transportation or some questions on mobility, but not a renovation of all the cars in the cities. Now people have their, their traditional car, uh, the one for the wife, the husband, the their teenager, and then they have an electrical car because they have some, uh, they also have some, some, uh, some C, some PV uh, cells in their roof and they're very environmentally friendly. Well, we need to to use cars only for long distances. We need to live in proximity and that's the only thing that could save us so that we can live in a more comfortable way so that our environment where we raise our children, where we where people can go for a stroll or uh, dogs can go for a stroll are more agreeable, more comfortable. We really are not going to be able to save the planet if we don't improve our cities. We have to. And the recipe to improve our cities is actually a recipe that has been there since since the Bukana report in 1963, which was something that was um, commissioned by the UK government to this engineer. So we have had that recipe for a very long time, but we haven't applied it to cook our cities. So we need to force politicians, civil servants to change their mobility culture. And the first thing that we need to do, well, right now the citizen citizenship movement is now having the polar um, revolution so that children can go by foot to school, the organizations, cyclist organizations, um, urban cyclist organizations are really working on this topic and that's where maybe we will be able to change the culture of mobility because there isn't much that can be expected from administrations otherwise. Administrations currently in Madrid, for instance, they have been thinking about parking lots, tunnels, um, putting uh, beltways underground. So lots of money that is coming from the gen next generation funds that are supposed to be green and for digitalization purposes are simply going to add new impacts on the territorial model that is more extent and more dispersed. And when we talk about the empty Spain, well, we don't see it. We don't see it because everything is concentrated in Madrid with the north area of Madrid and so on. So I don't think that Madrid or Barcelona or San Sebastián will get out of the European trend, no matter how many bikes they have in the Netherlands, which I believe is wonderful and I always admire them for what they do. We also have to um, consider the ecological footprint that we all have. We could always take the bike for to go... Uh, to go to work and it's better than it's better than private transportation but if then you do transatlantic trips because we're stressed in summer and we need to go to Fiji or whatever then that's not going to help the situation and what happens with with goods transportation which is also considered by the um, European Mobility Atlas this sort of freight transportation has to be something that is done in cities obviously not just in the center of the cities but also in the neighborhoods and it needs to be done on a bike that's that's optimum but if the freight or the goods that is being transported is 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 actually goods that had been traveling for thousands and thousands of kilometers then it's not useful it has to be uh, proximity all needs to be proximity goods we need to think that that which is distributed needs to be something that helps local commerce not something that destroys local commerce if a bicycle um comes from China or comes from I don't know many uh, any country in the planet at a lower uh, at a lower price then the local trade is going to to sink sink lower so the territorial model goes beyond that and I really think that we should bet on a better development of local economy so that we can maintain those criteria those proximity criteria which are the ones that allow for a more sustainable city because when we talk about bicycle, bicycle as an alternative, we're actually saying that we wish for cities to be more sustainable, to consume less energy in their mobility and for the emissions to, to be lower. And obviously, and most of all, the impact on the quality of the air, which currently in, in Madrid is actually very low because you know that we have uh, levels that are way above the limits that legislation 
um, sets and we are over the European legal limits and in no in no case whatsoever has any measure been taken to stop private transportation. So I don't know if you want me to go on. I think that you need to understand that we need to change the culture of mobility. We would have to 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 somehow talk to politicians and civil servants and city council so that they understand the situation. And this needs to change quickly because if we go step by step, we'll never get there. It needs to be done as quick, as, as fast as possible. I hope I haven't taken too much time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Pilar. Yes, um, clearly this is a very complex problem, obviously. But then we will talk about that maybe during the Q&A session when we're done with the first rounds of, of presentations. Although political will evolves, um, evolves at a slow pace, I don't know if citizen awareness is evolving maybe faster than political will. Our second speaker is Laura Vergara Roman, who's the president of Convici and she's a She's a counselor in mobility and she's also vice president of the company of the, of Mujeres en Movimiento. I met Laura a few days ago. She explained to me what Convici is and what they do. They analyze and they try to have an impact on legislation and that is what we're dealing with. And maybe that is one of the most interesting things because I guess that it's difficult to have an impact if you don't do it in an organized manner with people who have knowledge. So tell us, Laura, what is Convici? And tell us about these strategies and mobility laws. Are there reasons for hope? Uh, or do you see it as, as black as Pilar has um, painted it? Well, good afternoon. No, in general, I have to say that I am quite the optimist. And I think that the organization is optimist as well. And I think... I think that we have um, chosen the right path for change where we want to be headed to. And we are actually the route, the route is the wrong one. So we will always have to be asking for administrations and and other agents to realize that that they need to re um, calculate their route so that we can get to the common objectives that we have set for ourselves. So, first of all, I would like to thank you. I would like to thank the uh, Foundation Transición Verde to the Green European Foundation and to Nos Horizons for this opportunity that you have given me to share um, to share with you. Convici is the coordinator of entities for bicycles and what we do is we are made up of small groups all over the territory and we are in charge of detecting and and explaining to the different legislators what the problems are and what are the solutions or the proposals that the social tissue, the organized social tissue offers and the people who use bicycles on our day to day or those people who use or who will use a bike in the future because we're at a, at a, at a, at a moment where there is maximum demand from the social side to use bicycles in a safe way. So we have seen that there are specific blocks on the bicycle within the atlas. I would highlight the industry and delivery of goods, the transformation of cities and others that uh, actually impact us directly, such as the safety in, in roads and intermodality. But uh, it has not been treated as a system. And that is one of the words that Pilar has been using that system, that mobility system, because actually when we do our proposals, we don't just think about the bicycle as a tool, but also we think about how we interact with every other agent within the system, which is an intersectorial system that is linked to what happens in, in the rest of the sector that is interdependent as well. Uh, it depends on the ecosystem of cities, of the natural um, that natural spaces, everything that surrounds us, and and that is necessary for life. I mean, mobility is one of the fundamental rights that we have, and and life cannot take place without mobility. That is why we 
we see the potential and we see that we have to bet for it and we see the, that the alliance of bicycle with pedestrian areas and public transportation as the main access for and facilitator of life. So in Comiti we have set up collaborations and actions and I would like to highlight on the one hand the coordination of the uh, cyclist um, ecosystem with public administrations on the one hand and on the other hand the political actions that are developed by each of our proposals, initiatives, documents or interventions of each of our local groups in their territories. So I would like to highlight seven different blocks uh, for action. The first one would be strategies. Maybe in the context of the pandemic, from our point of view, that's what has changed the most, which is the discourse or setting common targets, common goals. We have seen that there is a lack of public space and that's a great problem. And it's not just a problem of cities. It is a problem uh, that is a state problem and it requires a uh, it requires national policies and strategies that will set goals in the long term. And in, in that sense, we have seen that two have been approved and one is on its way of being approved. The first one was the state strategy for bicycles, which was approved in March 8th, 2021, which is the one that really... Um, is the one that we have been fighting for most from the collective. The second is the strategy for safe, sustainable and communicated mobility. And this one transforms really the dynamics of the old Ministry of Public Works and it is now the Ministry for Transportation. So, so now they've not just changed their name, they've also changed their strategy, their dynamic, although there is still some to be done. That discourse, that strategy needs to become a reality and needs to alter the real dynamic of the ministry so that they stop managing and building roads to manage uh, that national policy for mobility. And there is a third one which is being drafted by the General Directorate of Traffic, which is the um, strategy for traffic and roads, because safety always has to be the first thing. It has to be a priority. So if it is safe, it will be sustainable. And if it is sustainable, it will be safer and vice versa. So that's the one that we're working on and will it will be approved very soon. So what do these strategies entail? Well, Beside the discourse, the public administrations need to have an evaluation system and follow-up system of their own public policies. And this is where we have, for instance, for bicycles, we don't have a good data system and we don't have specific indicators for the impact of those policies. And that is what we want to see developed. And this comes hand in hand with governance systems with management bodies and technical teams. Obviously, this is something that is lacking in public administrations, especially now that we will have the European funds. That's when they realize that they don't have the capacity to project, to design, to manage and to develop investments regarding mobility that really generate a disruptive change in cities. So. It's not just about um, drawing a bicycle lane in their maps. No, we need to have an, a complete redistribution of the public space and we need to have a mesh, a network that will allow for a reasonable and organized mobility uh, on a bike, on a bicycle. And also having bicycle parkings and other urban planning elements that will generate those changes in behavior. And then we have the legislation in order to guarantee a safety and legal, well, the legal safety of the people using it with a traffic law that has just been recently uh, reformed. We lost an opportunity. We missed out on an opportunity. There are reforms that have not been put in place. They did not dare. And now we have to see how those um, small modifications could uh, cause 
big changes in the circulation regulation so that we can ask for basic things such as um, the fact that any person who has a uh, who has um, an authorized bicycle could um, could transport their minors in their bike or could go through the downtown if they have the um, um, wagon attached to their bicycle that is legal. So this law, this traffic law is, is conditioning the reform of ordinances that are linked to the application uh, linked to the application of, of low low emission areas and all of this seems to be complex and it seems to be more of a strategic thing than an action thing but then there is the proposal for sustainable mobility law i thought that today my my uh, february 8th we would have read it for the first time at the Council of Ministries so that we could have a bit more information. But it seems that it's being delayed. And what we do know is that um, there are new documents. They have documents, um, strategic documents for planning. We know that it includes very few sanctions and a very general character to it. But we are waiting to read it so that we can make the relevant proposals. But that law should be uh, used so that we can go from strategies to action, so that we can really establish priorities, um, those priorities that have already been seen in the discourse, which is public transportation and bicycle transportation. So then there are physical physical changes. I'm not going to talk about this, but I think that Pilar has already talked about the multifunctionality and the dimensions that our cities have and our infrastructures have. These are the ones that condition and create barriers to mobility, to active mobility, and those physical changes are seminal. They they are necessary for other change to take place. And this is pushed by a, a refocus of investments. And I think that the next generation funds in this case uh, were something that we were very hopeful about. We thought that really they would renew the transportation system. And we, the first, uh, with the first Perte for um, e-vehicles, we realized that that was not going to happen. There is a complete unbalance in the transportation uh, system that is going to be maintained thanks to European funds. That does not mean that these European funds are not an opportunity for mid, uh, mid to big size companies change th certain things. But what is obvious is that the investments and the, and the modifications that are taking place with regards to e-vehicles are simply leaving us with cities that need the same dimensions, that have many of the negative impacts that the automotive sector had, that are not only um, left untouched, but rather reinforced. So that's bad news, but we do trust that those investments at least will take into account the impacts in health, environmental impact, social impact. And in the case of um, cyclist investments, they should be significant. They should be important and constant, not just to generate new spaces, but also to maintain, um, to maintain them and for planning processes. And I, I only have to talk about two last things. The first one is training training uh, skills for us to go around in bicycles. It's an element that is very much integrated in Europe and it usually overlaps with the uh, professional skills, um, professional training. We are a sector, well, they call us the new mobility, although we're not new. I don't think we're the new mobility because bicycles have been here for over 200 years. It has been created 200 years ago for mobility purposes, but we are generating new jobs. And training for those new jobs or for the integration of bicycles in certain classic um, things such as urban planning, architecture and so on that are very much linked to those changes, those changes of the dynamic of the um, mobility system 
is really a starting point for them to be integrated. So the value that that training has. And lastly, the last block is that of communication. And it's how we are transmitting the urgency of the fight against pollution, acoustic as well as air. And as Pilar was saying, not just to stop uh, climate change, but rather to mitigate the effects of climate change. And, and the urgency, this emergency cannot be felt. It doesn't seem that has been included in the modifications and in the actions that administrations are putting in place, public administrations are putting in place. So how do we want to do this? Because obviously these are lots of elements, a lot of elements that need to be integrated, but we want to do it from an equity perspective, equity with regards to gender, with regards to, to generations, with regards to a fair distribution of resources that we have and public space where we should guarantee that that right to mobility and all of it from our point of view has to do with generating a diverse cyclist culture that will have that capacity to welcome everyone who is thinking of using bicycles so that's that's what we can put on the table and obviously we will be happy to answer questions during the Q&A. Thank you so much, Laura. To be honest, I will ask you a question later on, but I have a question when you talk about a communication, when you talk about a system of communication, but it's also communication between citizens. How can I convince the parents of the of the kids in my kids' schools not to park their car at the school's door. But we will talk about that later on. And for the next speaker, I'm going to read a small fragment of another book, which is The Importance of Bicycles. And I believe that um, I think this person, the person who wrote this book, is one of your colleagues in Convici, Ricardo Marquez Hillero. And the book is a bit more recent. It was published in 2017. And this is the last paragraph. It says... I personally am convinced that in a future not far from here, the inhabitants of cities will remember the time when private um, cars dominated urban areas with the same unbelieving eyes as we now remember how people used to smoke in classrooms and buses. This will allow us to have lots of space because the space that was used for uh, transport was bigger with cars than now with bicycles. So this will be space that will be used for leisure, for the enjoyment of citizens. Obviously, the when you finish a book like this, you are optimistic, but it doesn't give us a deadline, does it? Because he doesn't know it. And he doesn't either say, and we could talk about that, if it will be um, a change, a transition that is peaceful or or not. And I will now introduce Jaime Caballero, who is someone who, um, who as a counselor is trying to advance in this direction. He is a counselor for um, mobility and sustainable development in Logroño. And I met him last year in June last year when we went to Logroño to visit different projects in the city. And I interviewed him for a video that you can actually watch in our YouTube channel. And the fruit of that visit was that we learned about the strategy Logroño Open Streets that had been awarded with the first uh, national award on mobility. And after we were there, I believe that he also got the award Ciudades que caminan, cities that walk. And it seems that something is being done in the right way in Logroño. So I wanted you to to explain to us, to those of us who are here who are not from Logroño, who might not know about this strategy. So could you tell us about these open street strategies and then tell us how the citizens are receiving it, how civil society organizations are receiving this. Are, is there a change in behaviors? And as we were saying previously, since political life is completely polarized, what is the resistance you're facing in the political arena as well as amongst uh, um, tradespeople in the city and so on? Jaime? Hello, Raul, and hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I 
warm greetings from Logroño. I would like to thank the organizers for having invited us to be a part of this roundtable. So first of all, Raul, I want to say that I that I share that that fragment that you have read. I completely agree with Ricardo's vision regarding optimism. I think that we are at a moment, at a tipping point, an unstoppable change that has been accelerated by the pandemic has come about. And I think that this is the beginning of that society that you were talking about of of open streets. So I'm going to tell you about the Logroño experience, but I also wanted to say that um, when we have had conversations with other cities, what I'm going to tell you is that uh, that this is something that could happen in, in any place, in any national territory. Uh, there is that rejection, as you said, Raul, and that is common in greater or lesser measure everywhere. I mean, that's something that happens in every place in, in Spain. Logroño Calles Abiertas was born during the pandemic. Uh, it was an urgent need to to redistribute the public space, uh, redistribution, as Laura was saying, that needed to be more equitable. And we put on the table of uh, what we m most knew that 80% of the public space is dedicated to 20% of the population who moves around in cars. So this is something that in the pandemic was, was shown. We wanted to revert that situation and create more space to move in a safer way. So what was this, which was so necessary due to the health emergency, as we started developing it, we saw that it is also necessary so that we can address the climate emergency. It's actually the same need to redistribute spaces and to promote a sustainable kind of mobility. And we also saw something that we already knew, talking about mobility is linked to public space. It cannot be separated from it because when you talk about public space, you say, how much public space do we want to destine to mobility? How much to cohabitation? And how much um, out of that mobility space, considering the inverted pyramid of mobility, has to be divided? We need to establish priorities. What's the active mobility? And then mobility of public transportation. So we need to talk about pedestrians, Firstly, we needed to enlarge our. Um, we needed, we needed to change the infrastructure. So, as I was saying, this is how, with enlarging sidewalks and so on, started our strategy that wanted to solve this redistribution problem with tactical interventions. This is what we have called tactical urban planning. We'd rather talk about interventions, and we have shown that we can, that we, uh, when there is this discourse of, no, this is not possible, this cannot be done, uh, streets are too narrow, well, then we see quickly, we quite quickly see, and in a cheap way we can see, in a flexible way we can see that that redistribution can take place in the urban spaces. So how, so where do we get the space from? Because obviously that's logical, if 80% of the space is dedicated to cars, then obviously we must, we, we, we see that to, in order to redistribute space, we need to take space out of, of the car area. So for instance, parking lots, as we made progress with our interventions after a presentation, after an intervention, the first uh, question asked by the press and the citizens was, so how many parking, uh, lo uh, how many spaces are there are going to be eliminated? Well, and when we said how many um, spots, parking spots were going to be eliminated, they said, well, what alternatives are you going to give us? And now we see that what happened was really that there were too many parking spots. If we managed them well, we had too many. And then during the second round of the debate, they would not really ask about the parking spots. They would ask about the about about uh, the second line. Well, in Logroño, as in many cities, we have uh, we have ways that are five meters wide so that we can really ha uh, have a, a double parking line. And thinking that cars go door to door in Logroño, Pemus, and all the plans that we have had for mobility, consider that, that um, these 
the main problem, the main problem for mobility in Logroño is this double line of parking cars. So when we have reduced our, um, we have reduced the space and we avoid the double line, that's where we really are touching a sore spot and that's where the citizens start reacting and especially many tradesmen women um, they think that a percentage of their sales is due to people who park in the double line for a little bit so that they can purchase here or there so that's the debate and then we have a problem which is that which I always try to to talk about in all forums which is that of logistics we have the need for logistics, for distribution that is actually hidden by this double line because we have in all cities uh, spaces where we can, we can simply stop for a few minutes to load and unload, but people use double lines to do that, to, to, to load and unload for parcels, for goods and so on. And now that everyone is um, doing online purchasing parcels being sent here and there are really on vogue. So in order to really advance for a sustainable mobility in cities, we have realized after these many interventions that have taken place, we have realized that we have to, to give uh, an impulse and a solution to this logistics. And I think that with low emission areas, we're going to take a step forward, but we need to really talk about the distribution of, of um, goods, loading and uploaded consolidation centers. And we can't really have um, um, housing building or just a house. We can't have three vans going um, during the morning to, to give three little parcels from three different companies. There should be just one vehicle and it should be a light vehicle, sustainable vehicle, for instance, a tricycle. Raul, you were showing at the beginning these, um, these images with logistics solutions with bicycles. So that's how we need to advance and it needs to advance quite quickly. So if you ask me, this, uh, the Logroño strategy, has it been useful in the city? This uh, open streets been helpful? Well, it has helped to put this debate on the table. We had a PEMUS from 2013, which had not been developed. And all of these concepts and all of these diversity, diverse uses, um, the uh, worry about public spaces was something that hadn't been uh, touched upon. So this obviously creates different reactions. So, so this is something that we need to take into account. In the strategy Open Streets, as I was telling you, we are extending public spaces, pedestrian spaces, and also bicycles, because we realized during the pandemic that it was a perfect tool to go from point A to point B in a safe way, and to stop using uh, buses and leave buses for those who needed it most, because people used it less, those buses were used less, and the strategy that I will share later on allowed us to create a basic network for distribution. So that is being now developed. It's being currently developed. And thanks to that basic network, together with the reduction of speed within the city that has gone down to 30 kilometers per hour and with the, with the super blocks, residential areas, we think that we can now share the space between cars and bikes, but we have to start from a basic distribution network, a segregated network where the most vulnerable people can feel safe and where we can promote mobility on, on bikes. And to that infrastructure, obviously, we have to add training. We, we set up the bicycle school for um, students who uh, are in second year, uh, primary second year, and the infrastructure needs to be safe to move around, but there also needs to be an infrastructure such as bicycle parking spaces so that parking is safe as well. We need to have a network of covered um, bicycle spaces that are under surveillance and so on. And then there needs to be a promotion of that active mobility. And that is where I'll stop and talk about the reactions. Because with this whole debate, what we have detected was that there were five groups of stakeholders, we could say five different 
groups with different reactions. And you have to talk to each one of them with, with different promotion campaigns from different perspectives. So the first one is that of the negationists, we could say, those who say no to everything. We all know them. They say that there are no mobility problems in Logroño because Logroño is small. There aren't any big traffic jams as in big cities. So there are representatives of associations who say, no, 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 in Logroño we don't have any mobility problems. Okay, I say so. What happens with those 400 people per year who have to go to hospital as a result of a traffic accident? Is that not a mobility problem? We have a third of, of minors who have obesity problems. Isn't that a mobility problem? We have big noise problems. That is an invisible problem that is still there. So there are problems that have been accepted as a reality. How can you say there are no, re no mobility problems? Well, we do have people who say there aren't. So you have to, to really um, deal with them, giving them information so that they understand what it is that they're saying. Then you have another part who say that they agree they agree with what is being done, but they are not willing to pay a price for it. So it's like, yes, okay, great. You do it, but please do not have it impact me and my behavior. So when we're talking about reducing space for cars, they say, well, no, no, no. Use bikes for pedestrian streets and for uh, sidewalks, but don't don't make me pay that price. So I'm I'm for I'm for mobility and transition, but don't talk my my part. And it's like when you talk about schools. Yes, yes, I agree with uh, having a peaceful environment around schools, but don't touch my area because I want to keep on using my car as I used it before. And then there's people who are for it; they are willing to change but they still don't have tools. What I was telling you about the people who are most vulnerable, people who say, well, if I had an infrastructure, a segregated infrastructure, then yes, I would take my bike. Or if I had a place where I could park my bike close to my home that is safe, I would do it, but I'm lacking tools. So those are the people we need to work with and we need to create those infrastructures that they need. Then we have the... Uh, the sector within uh, that do listen to us, like like um, neighbor neighbor associations that say, well, the city council does not listen to us. They don't listen to our voice. And that's an interesting debate because due to the pandemic and urgency, we did have some problems with participation, but that has been improved. But we never cover the expectations that everyone has with regards to participation. And when you do cover their expectations, what remains is saying is, is people a mistake participating without not listening to them? Yes, we did listen to you. We did listen to you. We did receive your suggestions. We have answered to your proposals, but obviously not everything has been um, has been considered. So they say, I made a proposal and since you did not do what I said, then you don't listen to me. So we have to try and make an effort to try and put on the table interests, the interests of one side of the other and try to explain very well, ex explain very well when certain proposals need to be rejected, others can be accepted and try and find this this common good and put it on the table. And then there are other people who say that what is being done does not work well. And we have to insist in improving the uh, ordinances and the, uh, and the rules and regulations, as Laura was saying. So we have to be very pedagogical about it. And, well, those are those five groups, those five profiles that we deal with that we have detected. And then the strategy, I don't know how I'm doing time-wise, I'm going to finish by talking about something that is also a reaction. I mean, it's what we've done very often, which are tactical interventions within our strategy. And as I was saying, we have to continue with this initiative, but, but it's not 
it's no longer open streets with uh, tactical interventions, but rather with a consolidation of what was tactical. And now we have new projects that are now put in place as you would a project, a traditional project, civil works and so on. But for actions to be better understood, they need to have an aesthetic quality to them. They need to have a certain quality to them because that makes debate easier. Because in Logroño, for instance, we had this new debate going on with new concepts, with new infrastructures, with European standards that were not known here in Spain. And at the same time, with tactic interventions that were unknown to people as well. So there were lots of new elements here. And we obviously had that task of trying to separate one thing from the other. So that people understood what was a simply a change of, of modes and what is this way of action. So I don't know, how am I doing time with Raul? Should I stop it here so that we have time for questions? If you want, you could have a couple more minutes to finish something, but you can, yes, but you can take two more minutes if you wish. Okay, so I'm going to use these couple minutes to talk about school areas because at the end of the other interventions, they have talked about, about schools. Well, in all of this strategy, we are really working in school environments. Some cities with the low emission areas are also focusing on school areas because we believe that that is the seed to transformation because good behaviors need to start at an early age and by acting on school areas not only are you acting on the early ages but you're acting on the whole educational community families parents parents teachers so this is better understood when you act in these school environments the debate is not as great because who's going to oppose to a boy or a girl accessing in a safe way, in a, in a healthy way to transportation so that they can get to their school. So it's an opportunity to work in that environment. And also because it's not just the seed to the whole city, it's also the seed to work on the super blocks, what we call super manzanas in Spain. So I told you that the basic um, cyclist line had to be um, reinforced. Well, in this super blocks, these are a piece, peaceful areas that can share all modes of transportation. But in all super blocks, in all of these neighborhoods, there's usually a school within. And, and that's the, the, the nucleus around which we can create that, that, that peaceful environment. And I think that this is something where we are working and it is really giving us great results and we will keep on working along that way. Thank you so much, Jaime. Well, it's funny that when you think about uh, about bicycles, when you think about it, when you, when, when you read about it and you don't think about interests, it's all advantages. It's more health, it's cleaner air. It's, you said it, Jaime, and if you hadn't done it, I would have done it. It's also eliminating noise. I remember from, I, I live close to Madrid in Algorcón, when Filomena went through Madrid, everything stopped for three days. No noise, no traffic. I had never listened to that silence, never since I moved here. So that is something basic as well. And what you were, what I was saying jokingly, which is not a joke, is how do I convince parents to not park at the at the school door by leaving their children and there's tensions in that in at that time when they're leaving their children in the chat there have been quite a few comments and it's actually quite lively with regards to comments i'm going to maybe ask one some of the questions that have already been asked on the chat and then if you want if you wish we could look at the comments so sandra was asking with regards to Barcelona, she said that there were lots of initiatives of the pandemic, there were tactic changes with regards to the public space, but there were too many criticisms, even by citizens who think that uh, public space is for cars. 
how can we tackle this change knowing that cars are a polluting element that worsens our health and well-being? Pilar, you were mentioning previously, you were mentioning previously that you have been fighting for many, many years. What would you say about this? Well, I will give you an example of what happened in my neighborhood and I am um, I'm, I'm astounded because I live in a, a neighborhood that is very left-wing, very alternative. Well... But it's really a suburban area, very suburban area. Um, a very family-oriented area, lots of green areas close to the Casa de Campo. And not long ago, Ecologistas en Acción started a campaign so that we could have uh, some um, means to measure uh, nitrous oxide in the area. And I wanted to have one of them here. And I asked the parents and they said, no, how are you going to do that? And I said, well, if the one in the Casa de Campo has high levels, then we must have uh, nitrogen oxide here as well. But they said, no, and how are we going to have our kids? Um, how are we going to to how are we going to make them come on foot? And this is an area that's only 15 minutes and they usually drive them in their four by fours. I mean, a kid who's eight kilos, who weighs eight kilos, we use tons of cars to move those kids around. So it's actually very difficult because the culture, the pro car culture has been there for years and years in favor of that model. And it is now very difficult to show that what is green, I mean, having trees does not mean that there is no pollution. And a four by four is not an ecological vehicle, even if you can, you can use it to, to go through mountains with it. And 15 minutes can be done on a bike as well. 15 minutes walking could be, I don't know, Laura, tell me, what would it be? Five, six? When I took my bike to the station when I was younger and I wouldn't fall and I wouldn't have any problems, I would take my bike and it took, I took, it took what, a few minutes. But now these kids who then do football here and there so that they burn their calories, they cannot take the bike or cannot go on foot to school. So it's actually very, very difficult. I... I don't know, we have to change the educational programs in primary schools and secondary schools and university schools as well, because I, I go to university and in third year when I start explaining my um, subject matter and I talk about Blue Grand Report, they haven't heard about it or Rio's conference, they haven't heard about it. So we are in a situation where they leave university without really knowing half of the basic things that they should know with regards to geography. Um, I mean, I, I teach geography. It's not quantum science or exact mathematics. So if you, you study geography and you don't know these things, I think it's serious. So the whole educational system needs to change. We also need to change the way in which culture, automotive culture works in publicity and ads that is, is pushed not just on TV, But uh, the press, nobody reads it, so that's no, not a problem. But also in social networks, when you are, when when you're on social networks, you see these these cars for families, four by fours, and so on. So obviously, there are lots of economic interests, and you know, a car salesmen are in crisis because they haven't sold as much as they wanted to. It's not that they haven't sold; it's just that they haven't sold as much as they would have liked to. So uh, now the Uh, all the news say, well, there's a crisis in the automotive sector. Well, it's very difficult. It's very difficult. I, from my point of view, believe that we don't need to make much investment, many investments to empower mobility, pedestrian and um, mobility with the current infrastructures that we have, as they have done in Loroño, as Jaime explained. The same infrastructures that they had for cars can now be turned into something else. They can change the rules of the game and now they decide who is going to use that space. Instead of being used by cars, it'll all be used by bicycles. Instead of uh, having such uh, such narrow bicycle lanes, let's have wider bicycle lanes and narrow car um, lanes. So we have to change the role and we will change the role of the users and we will see that it'll happen like in New York City with all of the tactic urban planning that they applied. Obviously, they have their own problems. They have their own concrete consequences that will need to be analyzed. But when you decide that Times Square is a 
pedestrian area, it fills up with people and cars disappear. That's it. Those decisions, like the ones that Logroño has taken or Pontevedra has taken without big investments, are the investments that need to be put in place. We mustn't wait for big European funds. There are lots of measures that can be set up. We don't need to wait for funds. Well, if the funds come along, then we'll do more things. But if they don't come, these are measures that have, mustn't just be done in the town centers, but also in the different suburban neighborhoods. My my um, neighborhood is filled with cars. It's in the uh, suburban peripheral areas. We could take the bike to go everywhere, but people take their car to go to the doctors, to go buy groceries, to take their kids to soccer and so on. So we have to change the model and we need to make p political decisions. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what to do. Maybe I should just do marketing and that's all and try and convince people, but maybe I'm not the right person for it. But I'm sure that there are people who could do it. Those who, who, those who sell shares in banks, they have the capacity to convince, so we should hire them so that they, they, they sell sustainable mobility around. I have been in this for a very long time and and often you recover everything that has happened and you think, why is it taking us such a long time to do such simple things, such easy things, things that could be so quickly done? Well, Pilar, I don't know if the people from marketing are already busy convincing us that in in a era that we should be reducing our emissions, now people are um, purchasing are purchasing um, a car. Now, now the weight of cars that move around in cities is is bigger. So I'm sure that there are some people in marketing that. Um, that might be for the sustainable mobility, but I think that most of them are not. So, Laura, I am going to ask the question um, that Christoph was asking. You were talking about the next generation funds, these funds that come from Europe. And actually, Spain has been a very good student, has presented its plans before anyone else. They have been approved. I know that the political discussion, the debate is on, but I was in a meeting um, the other day about this topic, actually, and someone from the platform for public transportation said, well, let's stop talking about e-vehicles. The e-car was invented over 100 years ago, and it's called tramway. And I thought, well, that's a, that's a great way of saying that we need a change in paradigm, not go from um, diesel or gas cars to... Uh, e-cars that's another problem with energy minerals and so on but if we had that transformation it wouldn't really affect many of the problems that we have in cities so i don't know laura if you're finding an excess of optimism with e-cars in mobility plans and in strategies for mobility that you're currently analyzing or in general well, yes, the problem is is that I'm not finding it there. The problem is that I am finding it in processes and legislative processes in the Congress. Well, last week, for instance, they approved the they approved for the procedure the royal decree that would then that would be processed urgently on energy efficiency led by the uh, Ministry for the Ecological Transition. So it has three measures. One of the measures is to make all legal changes that the automotive industry has asked for, and they call that for the efficiency of electric mobility, which is a lie. And then they have two other elements with regards to renewable energies and other matters. So... When I see that debate in the Congress, I see that everyone is using the data that the uh, Car Manufacturers um, Association is providing them with. So, so, so I call them, I call the political groups in the parliament and I say, what are you doing? What are you doing? How can you defend this as a priority when the national plan, the integrated plan for energy and climate, also approved by the Ministry for the Ecological Transition, has set a change in mode to electrification of e-cars. So the policies are 
doing what they think is easiest, what they think would have the 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 best message and with the best figures and data. But if you scratch the surface, according to articles that we have uh, recently read, it seems that the industry, the car industry, is simply lying. And they are accounting for um, for their contribution to to GDP, multiplying it by three, and to the added value of production. They're multiplying it by three. And not only has this been allowed, but it has been integrated in that royal decree. In the minutes of the board um, of the board of um, and the ministries council when they when they approve the perte for for cars, so without a political filter, they are giving priority to that which is easy and to economic interests that have not taken into account the external uh, elements, negative external elements of that part of the sector. They haven't taken into account the cost, the economic cost of the fatalities and accidents that they cause. They haven't taken into account the health implications, noise, pollution. They haven't taken into account premature deaths that are caused by by cars, they haven't taken into account the environmental impacts and biodiversity impacts and ecosystems by big infrastructures of um, road transportation. They haven't taken into account the unbalance that that access to employment has and the access to cars, which is that gives access to to that to that job which is in an area of the city that is called industrial area, which is, which is, which is foreign to public transportation and active transportation. And all of that without filter is not that it has gotten into the general population as an acquired right that they defend to the death because they are not capable of seeing that there is an alternative and that in that neighborhood you could go on foot to your school or you could go on bike to your school. So that change cannot just be by convincing everyone one by one, all of your neighbors. It needs to be a structural change. It has to come with physical changes, infrastructures in um, um transportation infrastructure changes that will allow for that active mobility. And it needs to be structural because, because of the investments that are being made and because of the calls for European funds. But it also needs to be structural with regards to the laws and the strategies and the actions, political actions that are put in place. I mean, the social social tissue, organized social tissue, as well as public administrations need to need to see that. So we need to give visibility to the falseness of that data and give visibility as well to everything that they are not showing, which is that, that impact. And all of that, take it to the people who are deciding to the decision makers, because I, I, I feel ashamed of the fact that the Ministry for the Ecological Transition to be the one leading this perpetuation of the privilege of cars through electrical cars. Yes, absolutely. I. It's really complex. And it's also true that this is a sector that has a lot of impact in in the economy, with their jobs, with and as Laura said, we needed to, we should review the, that information with care. But it looks like what we're doing is like is, is, is kicking kicking the can down the street. I mean, we instead of doing the transformation that we should do, we are getting in um we're getting ourselves in in a bigger trouble. Just a comment, just a comment, because I saw something that has been said. I mean, the the job thing. Some funds, some European funds are being given to the automotive sector that generates a series of jobs, but that is not conditioned by a, by a re, by re, reconverting the industry. So when we don't defend the automotive industry, it's not that we are not defending jobs 
what we have to defend is actually those jobs. And that is what really hurt me from the parliamentary groups. They were not defending the job itself. What they were defending was the industry and the production of the e-car. Yes. Yes, that that is the Institute of Just uh, Transition from the Ministry for Ecological Transition has actually con decided very well with regards to the closing of mines, of coal mines and, and nuclear power. They should be the ones to really tackle many of it, other industries that will not be maintained because climate change is serious, ladies and gentlemen. Jaime, there was a question for you um, by Christophe, who said that in Bilbao we have 30 kilometers per hour in the whole city, um, two-way um, two lanes were simply um, a hurdle along the way and he wanted to know if you had done an analysis of traffic density. If you take out one and a half meters for the bike lane, how many more people could could be included. I understand that he refers to the capacity of our of our streets and our roads, right? That is the question. How this affects the capacity of of the of the lanes by doing this redistribution? Well, first of all, we in Logroño haven't really seen a change. I mean, there hasn't really been a change. It's funny because that that excess of space for cars was causing, as I said, this double line. So when we have reduced the space, what we have eliminated is actually the possibility of parking in the double line. But that, that lane was already eliminated by the double line. So the capacity of the lane itself is the same one. And what we try now, uh, some way, is to really care for intersections because in urban, spaces regardless of the the speed whether it goes down to 30 since it is more seamless the traffic in the end it, it takes a shorter to get from a to b as it has been proven but what defines the um the the the, the streets is the intersection so in intersections we have had to get to some some situations where we tried not to have a very harsh alteration but in general, it hasn't really affected our traffic. But what is, what's fun to see is the difference in interpretations and perceptions by people who use the car. Because when that space is occupied by other cars parked in a double line, they understand that that does not, um, that does not reduce the capacity. But when it's used by other users of other vehicles, such as bicycles, then they think that they are stealing capacity from mm -hmm. them. So that, or if it is um, a bus lane or a bicycle lane, many more people can use it. So we have been also doing exercises with bus lanes as well. So now instead of having a double lane, we have a bus, a bus lane and people complain, but we say, no, listen, we haven't done much. Well, what we have done is the car capacity is the same. You have the same lane, but now we're giving capacity to other vehicles who are transporting 100 people who are many more than the people who are in a car. And, and, and it goes, it works better, it's more agile and more comfortable. That is why I insisted on the double line. And when you were saying, what can we do to convince people? Well, not only do we need to be pedagogical about it, but by reducing double, double lines in cities, it is uncomfortable to use cars. What makes cars comfortable is to be able to have this feeling of going from door to door and being able to stop wherever you want. But if you take that possibility out of the equation and it is not comfortable to take your car in the city, that's the best pedagogy because because people will say, well, I'm going to park somewhere else. Instead of um, in the school, I will park somewhere else because I know I won't be able to park. So I will take the bus or I will go walking or I will take my bike. So that's the best pedagogy, really. And Laura was saying uh, that, uh, was talking about cars. They We are being accused all of going against cars and so on. We don't want to criminalize cars because... I mean, they're good in their way, but cars can be very useful in, in the, on the road and to, to travel and so on. But what we need to, um, to abuse their use in the downtown. So there are many other, um, many other uses that are not the cars. So, so cars are not them there to abuse of them. So in cities, we have to care for spaces for other uses. 
I think that was all I wanted to say. I wanted to just uh, take a look at all these things. I hope that was enough. Yes, thank you, Jaime. Thank you very much. It's already 22 past. We still have eight minutes. So I'm going to answer to the last question that is being, that is being um, asked. And I'm going to ask this question to all of you so that it is the last time you take the floor. And I ask you to be brief, to be short, because we only have eight minutes. So Carmen Molina was asking, why does it take so long? I mean, she was asking Pilar. Um, she said, very, very true, Pilar. And the question is, why does it take such a long time to convince of necessary changes when they're easy and simple? And... I would like to say that when I learned about this, about this strategy, when I learned about it um, in one of the meetings of the Green European Foundation was that it was really cheap, that any city could put it in place. So sometimes it's just tactics. Sometimes it's something that is not very expensive. You don't need a very big infrastructure and it's very efficient. Why does it take such a long time to convince of necessary changes when they're easy changes and simple changes? Who can answer this question? Well, Why? Well, because I think it's very important uh, what Logroño, what San Sebastián have done, what Pontevedra have done, because when people see it, and actually Jaime was saying it as well, when people see that there aren't mm, problems because you take a lane and give it to some other means of transportation, everyone sees it. When they see that in La Concha, it took 20 years to be done ever since the first demands that cyclists made in Donosti until it was open. And now people realize that it worked very well and there weren't really traffic problems due to that. Well, you need to have a politician and someone in the city council who's a civil servant who make this decision. That's, that's the main problem. We either train politicians and civil servants so that they understand the reality and we take them to, to, uh, to spiritual retirement, um, um, <laughs> Uh, to spiritual retreats so that they understand the need for these changes or I don't know what to do because if they don't take the decision we can't prove citizens that that is possible Jaime must have been to one of these retreats hasn't he I think I think that it is It can only be proven with practice. I mean, someone has to try it out. Someone who tries to move around in bicycle, because bicycle is one of the best sustainable means of transportation in cities such as Logroño with regards to agility and time. So if you really try it out, you realize, and then when you choose the way in which you want to move around, you always choose the, the most practical way and the most useful way. So it's about disincentivizing those means that are not sustainable, like cars, and to incentivate those which are sustainable. So I think that that transformation is going to take place, even with uh, people who really are reticent, who, who are reluctant, because I think that um, cars are, are not good. And we have been for many decades... Um, having a status quo and a, a distribution of a public space that is unfair and we were born with it and we have seen it and when we've done tactic interventions in, in the sidewalk we did for instance an intervention and we gave priority to or um, I'm sorry in the streets um, we gave priority to pedestrians people really didn't didn't go and walk down the street because they 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 weren't used to it but if you If you get used to it, that's how you change. And if you ask Google, how do I go from here to here? And it tells you how long it takes you to go on a car, on bus, um, on a bicycle, etc. And that's how you see. And in that time estimate, the sustainable means of transportation should be faster, should be better than the car. Because otherwise... People will keep on choosing the car. When you, uh, when with a car, you see that you have to go round and round. You have to park your car. Then you will not uh, choose the car. That's how you incentivize the uh, you de incentivize the use. That's how I see it. Thank you, Jaime. Laura. Well, if I have to choose one, I would say the social organized tissue, the social organized fabric and political action. I think that we are in the midst of a transition moment. It is the most important moment for us to participate in spaces, in, act, in spaces for social action. 
and for interaction because the more we say the 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 more we p repeat it the more proposals we we generate the closer we will be from change because as i said at the beginning it seems that the speech the discourse has changed and i agree that we need less resources than other parts of the sector but they are necessary for for us to change things especially physical elements that will cause that change and the rest will come i mean bicycle is so thankful really that when we when we get those public administrations those people who make decisions to approve it to integrate it in their policies they people will change their behaviors they will change it and it will it'll be accepted will it be too late well i hope not i honestly hope not but but let's recalculate the route constantly recalculate the route we have to we have to have a common a common road ahead. Well, there are many topics we haven't been able to talk about. We haven't talked about health. We haven't talked about humor because you don't feel the same way when you go on your bike to work than when you're on your car stuck in a traffic jam. And we haven't talked about what world we want, but we don't have time for all of those things. Uh, Kim actually wrote a comment saying that it's also important to get Renfe to stop being an obstacle for bicycles. We need to have more trains that are adapted to bicycles etc absolutely everything that is making um, bicycling easier is obviously positive but i wanted to use this this comment to tell you that next tuesday we will have our last session on mobility and we will be talking about the railroads and the potential of railroads not just to turn into an alternative for freight um for for freight transportation and to reduce co2 but also to to connect the territory something that is quite important and that session will be at six as well just as today and we will have Tilly Metz and a European MP the president of Transición Ecológica Juan Tauralde will be present and And I don't know, maybe Manel Ferri, I don't know. I don't know because we, we don't know. We were um, asking him to be a part of this. So we invite you all to participate during our next session. And that is all. I just wanted to thank Pilar, Laura and Jaime, obviously, for being here with us. It has been a real pleasure to listen to you all. Although you always have this um, bittersweet taste wouldn't it be wonderful to bet for this but how difficult it is it's always so difficult although it shouldn't be that difficult i mean if we weren't pushed here and there by interest we wouldn't be able to do it and i wanted to also thank the people who make this make this possible john who is in charge of all the technical aspects matilde our translator um and we are also recording this session so that it's also available in English and my colleague Soledad for organizing this whole thing. So, so Soledad is actually sending me, uh, he's, uh, sending me a message. You should have also mentioned José Luis Ordóñez, who's the spokesperson for the state coordinating platform, who will be present next Tuesday. So thank you all. Thank you all so much for dedicating your time to thinking about these things and let's start cycling. Thank you so much. Greetings to you.